الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Today here we've got a risala by Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Shawkani, which is entitled Risala fi Hukm al-Mawlid, which is known for us as the Milad al-Nabi. As an introduction to this topic, Allah says in the Quran, "Kul in kuntum tuhibun Allah." The scholars have taken this ayah to say that love for Allah and His Messenger is a pillar of your iman. In fact, your shahada, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, will not be sahih without it. It will not be correct without saying, uh, without having love for Allah and His Messenger. But uh, the question here now, presenting itself, is how do we gain this love? Now, unfortunately, the, what the Muslim woman is going through right now is they feel that they are the ones who are, have got the privilege of the love of Allah on top of them. They feel that Allah loves them. This is what's happening in the ummah today. So if you ask them, why do you perform the mawlid, why do you do etc, etc, it's because we are correct. But the, 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 the way of the salaf is the opposite. The way of the Salaf is the opposite. It's not about me feeling that I am loved. The question is, does Allah love you? This is the real question. So that's why we see in the Quran so many times, Radiallahu, uh, Radiallahu Radu An. Allah loves them and they love Allah. This is the connection. It's not that we feel that we are the safe sect, we are the Muslims. Therefore, Allah loves us, and whatever we do is correct. So then how do we gain this love of Allah? This is the question. This is what the ayah is saying. Some of the salaf uh, describe this ayah as the ayah of imtihan. The ayah which tests your iman. Are you really a believer in Allah? Qulin kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabiuni. If you really love Allah and His Messenger, then you have to follow them. This is what love entails. And this is why Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, some things are forced in acts of obedience to Allah. The sun is forced, the moon is forced. They have no options. They have to obey Allah. But the true obedience to Allah is when you have free will. And when you have free will, this is only pushed with love and obedience. So when you have free will, the test of your iman comes whether if, you are, if you've got the correct love for Allah and His Messenger and if you're going to obey Allah and His Messenger. Because we've got free will to do so or not. And he also says in another place that ilm is very, very important. And that's why we're studying this here today. Because anybody can claim they love Allah and Allah loves them. Anybody can claim that they are upon the correct path and what they're doing is beloved to Allah and His Messenger. But the point here is Ibn Taymiyyah says that the more you have knowledge then the more you will increase in love of Allah. The more you have knowledge. <coughs> so knowledge is the basis to build your love and your iman upon. And the more you will love them, Allah and, and, uh, and the Messenger, the more you will follow them or seek to follow them. So this is, this is the, the benchmark here. This is the benchmark that has been set by Ahlul Sunnah. That we are not trying to say that we are beloved to Allah. Nobody can claim that. The only way you can know whether you're beloved to Allah, the most important thing is, is that does Allah love you? And are you doing something which has been legislated by Allah and His Messenger for you to attain that love? So this is the introduction here. Now, um, this book here we have is uh, been translated uh, as a treatise on the ruling of celebrating the Prophet Wasallam, Risala fi hukm al-Mawlid. Uh, some of the scholars have said, just to explain this title, very briefly here, I think three copies are going around. Uh, some of the scholars have said that uh, Imam Shokani, when he wrote this book, he, he called it a bath fi hukm al mawlid. What's the difference? Risala means that it's a book, but uh, a bath means when we're talking about research. Now, this is very, very important for us living here in the West because here, what we are going to study here is not how do you refute the claims. If somebody comes up to you and says, I believe in such and such, whether it's Milad and Nabi or whether it's something else. I believe in such and such. Let me see how I can refute him. That, that's not the point here. 
The point here is, is to understand the mas'ala. We have to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the usul that's derived around it. If we have the capabilities to understand the definitions and the lugha, and if we have the capabilities to look at its precedence in Islamic history. If we can do this, and we can put this into context, then you will have, and you do this with every single mas'ala, as much as you are able, then you will be firmly grounded in these different masail. Not that somebody comes up to you and says, what's the ruling on Milad Nabi? Ah, it's bid'ah khalas. No, what we're talking about here is that we go through this bath and we see how the scholars have looked at it from different viewpoints. Is there an angle within the sharia that can allow you for, to do this? And this is why if you look at the, the Kibar ulama of Saudi Arabia, they've decided to call their panel Buhuth wal Ifta. First they research and then they give a fatwa. And if you look at some of the questions, if you look, for example, in uh, Bab al-Tahara, some of them are very, very simple. You just think, how can this questioner be asking this question? It is so black and white, so basic. But then what's more ajib than that, what's more strange than that, how can you have five or six or maybe even more kibar ulama getting together and talking about this one mas'ala that we can deal with in primary school, probably. The point here is not that we quickly respond. The point is that we sit, we contemplate, we look at the different viewpoints from the Sharia so that you can have malaka, as the, the ulama have explained, that you can have a firm ground in, the, in these different masail and see how ahkam are, are derived. So this topic obviously is very important today. That's why I think we're all here and we've attracted uh, you know, this audience here. And some of the shubahat that we face in the West, especially, is that, like we said before, if you love the Prophet وسلم, you must profit. If you love the Prophet وسلم, you must practice the celebrating of his birthday. This is an alama of hope for the Prophet. This is a sign that you love the Prophet <coughs> And that's why the introduction is very important because we need to set that as a foundation. Love is derived from following. It can't be any other way. You can't say you love someone and you don't follow them. And this is why the scholars of the usul they say that if you the, the, the asal of the Amr is that it's wujub. If Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have told you to do something, salah, or ita zakah, that means it's, it's wajib, khalas. And the scholars have taken this further and said that if you don't do the imtithal of the Amr, if you don't follow the, the commandment correctly and promptly, then you could be sinful. The point that I'm trying to make here is if your father, for example, tells you, go get me a glass of water. And you just sat there staring at him, blank face. Are you following him? Obviously not. Are you negligent now? Obviously yes. So now where is the, where is the sign of your love to him? It's not present. Clearly it's not present. So that's why the father gets angry. My son, why are you not behaving? Why are you not listening to me? Don't you love me? You feel like you can disobey me? All of this comes from the fact that you have a relationship of love. So this is where the scholars of the Usul have also mentioned this. So it's very important that we set this down as a preface. You know, that love can only come about by true following. So that when you can, we're at Shubhat, some of the people saying that we, we love the Prophet ﷺ, that's why we celebrate his birthday. Other Shubhat now that are evolving is that they're saying that we're not taking this as an eat. It's just a day of reflection. It's just a day of reflection. We're not practicing anything wrong. There's no shirk going on. There's no music. There's no mixing. It's just a day that we specified for reflection. Other people are becoming even more liberal. And they're saying, what, what, what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. Why can't we introduce new dates within our Islamic calendar? The, the orthodoxy of Islam needs to change. You guys are too rigid. So these are some of the shubahat that we're facing. And this is perfectly in line with the, the way the author has... Uh, written this book. There are other books that were written way before Imam al-Shawkani. Imam al-Shawkani came in the 12th century and the 13th. And this bit, as we will see, historically came about in the 6th or the 7th century. So there's a big gap. But the reason why we've chosen this book is because of the way it's been written. Uh, the, 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 title of the, the title of the book is Risala fi Hukm al-Mawlid. Now there's a... Um, I found, you know... Uh, a point that I wanted to make here is that 
Mawlid <coughs> is grammatically more correct. We hear, often hear people saying Milad, Milad al Nabi. And the scholars of the Lugha have said that Mawlid is more correct. Now, if you look at the books that have been authored about this, uh, this particular field, all of them have the word Mawlid and not Milad. <coughs> All of them have the, the word Mawlid and Milad, and some of the names of the books will be mentioned in, in, the, chap, in the chapter that comes about it. There's a slight difference between Mawlid and Milad. They both come from the root word which is Walada, so something which is born or something which has birth. But the, the scholars of, of Lugha said that there's a Nisbah al Fi'l. So when we have a Nisbah al Fi'l, it becomes the place of the ismul maf'ul, and it's getting a bit technical, but the point here is, is that the Prophet, if we're talking about something which is born or come out of birth, the correct reference to it would be mawlid and not milad, even though there's a very delicate difference. And an example they gave is walid, uh, walidah becomes the mawlid, just like idda becomes the mawid. This is the pattern that they've chosen. The grammatical, you know, the surf of it. And this has been mentioned in uh, Taj al-Arus, and it's also been mentioned in Misbah Munir. So, I mean, I don't know if, if it's getting petty, but if, if somebody is talking about Milad and Nabi, grammatically it would be more correct to say, Mawlid. A bit about the author before we begin reading, inshallah. His name is Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Shawkani. Uh, he came in the 12th century, he was born in 1170 in Yemen, and he passed away in uh, 1250. Uh, the scholars after his period re referred to him as Shaykh al-Islam. Referred to him as Shaykh al-Islam. So if you hear the word Shaykh al-Islam used by the scholars of Yemen after this period, it is referring to Imam al-Shawkani. And the reason why is because he was a great mufassir. He has a very big collection of tafsir, and he has a very big collection of fiqh. And he came from a background which is Shi'i Sufi. So in the, the, the time period that he was living in, he himself was a Shi'i and a Sufi who practiced this practice of Milad. And also the society that he lived in was full of shirk. And it was full of khurafat that we will find maybe for us today. And some of the masail that we will find, that we find ourselves in. So it's very strange to see that Allah guides this person and not only does he take him from the, the, from the midst of shirk, but he makes him an imam. And this sheikh himself later on had a very, very big impact on the life of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab to the extent that we will even see in this book, Imam Shawkani wrote something, a paragraph, and this paragraph became, I don't know it's best, but it's very similar to Qawaid al-Arba, very similar in the points that are made in Qawaid al-Arba. And if you look at what Imam Shawkani wrote and some of his approaches and the influence from Shaykh al-Islam and uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, you will see that the da'wah has some kind of chain. So Imam uh, ibn Taymiyyah had an influence on Qayyim. Ibn Qayyim later had an influence on Shawkani. Shawkani then later had an influence on Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Praise Allah for the one who sent the bringer of glad tidings and the one who came as a warner. The illuminating lantern with a, sh with a sharia which is pure and clear. A monotheistic religion which has widespread acceptance, predominant and inviting its, in its message. In its people are the carriers of the sunnah, irrad irradiating, irradiating. Irradi irradiating its radiance moving by, by all traces of darkness and despondency. Uh, this, trans this was translated by myself, so any problems with the translation is not the brother, it's clearly my own deficiency in the English. Uh, this uh, introduction is clearly showing a setting down the manhaj of Ahl sunnah The manhaj of Ahl sunnah is to follow the kitab and the sunnah. And this is what he's saying, we are the monotheistic religion, and the people who follow this monotheistic religion carry the sunnah. Now, uh, Imam Shatibi says in the Itisam that we can tell the difference between a, a, a Sunni, Salafi today, a Sunni and a Bid, uh, Mubtadi' by either two ways. By either two ways. Either the person himself calls himself 
something out of Salafiyyah or that he leaves the usul of Salafiyyah and the usul of Salafiyyah is to follow the Quran, Sunnah, understanding of the manhaj of Salaf Salih now this could be in usul and it can also be in furu' it can also be in your aqidah that you have clearly gone away against the grain of Ahlul Sunnah knowingly or it could be a practice that you've got which is a, a fiqhi practice but this resembles that of Ahlul Bid'ah and once you attach yourself to that and you opt to leave the way of the Salaf then you can be attached to uh, that deviant sect and that's why you find in some of the books of Aqidah they talk about wiping over the socks uh, is a sign of Ahlul Sunnah meaning that at the time at that time of the author wiping over the socks was a sign of the Ruafid so a sign of a Sunni would be that he would wipe over the socks the point here is what Imam Shatibi is saying that uh, somebody is defined of leaving as Ahlul Sunnah in these two ways and this is the introduction that has been set down by Imam Shatibi to proceed from the humble servant Muhammad ibn Ali al-Shukani, may Allah forgive his and his father's sins, was asked about the celebrating of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, birthday. He said, I say... Okay, uh, here we have two things. Here the Shaykh is going to talk now. Uh, he has categorized his fatwa. This is basically a fatwa. It's a small risala, but it's basically a fatwa. He was asked about celebrating the Prophet's birthday. And he categorizes this fatwa into three or four different segments. And the first segment he's going to categorize is, is looking at the dalil. Then he will look at the, the implications of uh, celebrating the Prophet's birthday. Then he's going to look at it historically. And then he gives a summary as to what his conclusion is and why he believes that conclusion. Uh, but here it's very important to note that the word birthday is being used here. Now, there's a footnote here that the birthday in itself has many reservations. Uh, Sayyid Ali Fikri, who was a very famous historian, and there's you know, no dispute about his level of caliber, said that it's not from the way of the Arabs to celebrate birthdays. There was no precedence at all. Not from Jahiliyyah, not from after Jahiliyyah to celebrate. And this book, uh, this point he mentioned in his book, Muhadarat al Fikriya. What does that mean? Uh, lectures or reflections on the theological aspects or the ideological aspects within society. So clearly he has mentioned the use of birthdays being injected into the Islamic Ummah because there is an ideological attack. There is something going on. Now it's mentioned here in... Uh, in the uh, Encyclopedia of Americana, which is the 1991 edition. And I'm trying to be very specific here because this is a very, very important point. It says in the Encyclopedia, the ancient world of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and Persia celebrated birthdays of God, gods, sorry, gods, kings, and nobles. Birthdays was a practice of worship, to worship the birth of their god, or to worship the birth of their king, because this is worship, because the kings at that time wanted to be worshipped, or nobles, people they saw as being pious, saints, and that kind of thing. Okay? Authors Ralph and uh, Adil and Linton revealed the underlying reason for this. They said that people uh, were worshipped in these civilizations to be honoured, which is a form of worship for us uh, in Islam. And this is where horoscopes have come from. And horoscopes are used for sihr, and horoscopes are used for all kinds of different types of shirk. So there is a different, there's a, de there's a definite <coughs> connection between celebrating birthdays and astrology. And it's very interesting to know that the Christians did not celebrate the birth of Christ. And initially they said that this was a pagan custom. This was a pagan custom, and they completely outright rejected birthdays. So it's very, very important that we define uh, what a birthday is. It's obviously celebrating an annual date of the beginning of something. And it's historical precedence. Now, like we said, all the civilizations, Egypt, Greece, Rome, and Persia, the big ones, did this to worship their gods. The Arabs, no such thing. <coughs> So now the author is going to talk about what is the dalil, what is the dalil 
for such a, a practice. Sort of. to proceed from the humble servant. I say, sorry, I say thus far. I say thus far, I have not found affirmative evidence from the book, nor from the sunnah, nor from the scholarly consensus ijma, nor from al-qiyas, analogy with the two <coughs> established rulings in the sharia, nor from al-istidlal, the process of uh, der der derivation. To support the Mawlid. Rather, there is a scholarly consensus that celebrating the birthday of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was not present at the time of the best generation, i.e., the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, nor after those after them, i.e., the students of the companions, may Allah have mercy upon them all, nor those after them, i.e., the times of the four Imams and those like them, may Allah have mercy upon them all. Scholarly, scholars throughout the generations have all agreed that celebrating the birthday of the Prophet is an innovation which was invented by, uh, by Sultan Al Mudaffar, Mudaffar Abu Sa'id Kokbuni Kok bin Zayn al Din Ali ibn Sabaktain in a place called Ibn. Ib okay. uh, here, the, the Sheikh is saying that there is no precedence in it, there is no Dalil to say that we can take this day as a, a work, uh, as a day of worship or celebrating the Prophet birthday. Uh, but the scholars, in fact, differed on when the Prophet was actually born. And they've all agreed that he was born in Amal Field when Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba. That was the year that he was born in. And they are all agreed that he was born in Rabi al Awwal, generally. Some of them said Ramadan, some of them said outside of Ramadan. Some of them said Safar, the month of Safar. And they are all generally agreed, there is no difference of opinion that he was born on a Monday because the Prophet ﷺ uh, And this is in uh, Sahih Bukhar. Now, it's interesting to note here that the, the historians say that he was born in Amal Field. Clearly shows that at that time the calendar was based on events, not based on dates. So if this is the year when Abraha came, that's how they defined the biggest event of that year. That's the year where Abraha came. Had it been an important year, they would have said this is Am, Mawlid, and Nabi. Clearly, this is the biggest. They would have backtracked it and they changed, just like Islam changed everything else that was important. So this is a very important principle here that at that time in Jahiliya, uh, years were defined by their events. Uh, there were other events that came afterwards But this is a very important point Now the scholars have differed They said that he was born in Rabi al-Awwal And some of them said They all agreed that he was born on a Monday But what was the exact date? Some of them said he's, he was born in the second of Rabi al-Awwal And this was mentioned by Waqidi Waqidi was a very famous historian He's an authority in history himself Especially in the seal of the Prophet So him saying that it was the second Has some weight So Clearly, the 12th is not the correct date. Uh, some of them said this, it was the 8th, and Imam Malik held this opinion, and Zuhri as well. And uh, these are famous Imams, uh, you know, these uh, people that came have been narrated in the Qutb al Sitt. This shows their level that Imam Bukhari, his teacher's teacher, was, uh, you know, Malik or Zuhri. And Zuhri was somebody who benefited from many of the companions. And they said he was born in the 8th. And this is very interesting because there are some people who practice this, uh, this uh, uh, celebration or this festival and they claim to be Mali on the 12th. Uh, Mujahid, the student of Ibn Abbas, said it was the 10th. But the majority said it was the 12th that he was born on. This is what the majority have gone with. Um, some of the scholars, though, have looked at this and they've said that this doesn't correlate. Why so? Because we said in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that Monday was the day he was born, it was the day that he was sent as a messenger, happened on Monday. There's another narration which says that he entered into Medina on a Monday, so his hijrah <coughs> started on a Monday, and that was the day also that he passed away. 
So now they said that if these happened, you know, the, the meaning here that they're using here is that that was the day I was born and that was the day that he will die. So they are saying that the dates are the same. If he was born on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal, it means that he will die on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal. But Suhaili, who is another very famous historian, said that this doesn't make sense that it to, be, to be on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal. The reason being is that we know that the final Hajj of the Prophet ﷺ, in the final Hajj, Arafah, which is the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, was a Friday. After Dhul Hijjah we have Muharram, then Safar, then Rabi al-Awwal, three months. So between the 9th of uh, Dhul Hijjah, final Hajj of the Prophet Wasallam, three months after that the Prophet was to die. He didn't know that, but he was, he was to die. Now they said that no matter how you calculate it, if we say Dhul Hijjah was 30 days, Muharram was 30 days, Safar was 30 days, or if you say this was 29, this was 30, and this was, no matter whatever combination that you use, it's impossible for the 12th of Rabi al Awwal to be a Monday. It doesn't, it doesn't correlate. And our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim al Khudair, said that the historians, the Orientalists, you couldn't get their head around this. Because they were, like, they were looking at the, the 12th of Rabi al Awwal and how it fits in with the Gregorian calendar, and there was no correlation. 12th of Rabi al Awwal, the day the Prophet passed away, and the Gregorian date that was given. But the majority have an answer for this. I mean, the point here is that there's no, you know, there's no consensus, there's no agreement, there's a big khilaf, there's, you know, munakasha, there's a lot of discussion that's going on. They said that um, the day he was born, meaning it was a Monday, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the same date. So the hadith of the Prophet said that that's the day I was born, doesn't necessarily mean that he, it's a Monday. It's talking about Monday, it's not talking about the same date. That's the first point. And the second point that he uses is that the Prophet ﷺ was in Makkah, and Makkah has a different moon sighting to Medina. So when he came back to Medina, that's where the days got disrupted, so to speak, in their chronological order. But the point here, the point here I mean, I mentioned this as far as that, but the point here is it's very important that we know that there is no agreement, especially with the Maliki, saying as the eighth, and some of them claim to be Maliki, and they follow the Sufi tariqah in worshipping. Uh, or celebrating the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi birthday. Uh, in this um, paragraph, the Shaykh is talking about now how uh, can we look at this when it comes to Islamic uh, sources. Now he's saying there's no precedence in the Quran, it's not in the Sunnah, none of the companions did it. There's no Qiyas, there was nothing like this at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's no Istidlal. Now there's a difference between Qiyas and Istidlal. Qiyas is when you have something and you want and another thing which is similar to it in a different situation and you apply the same hukam based on what you have from the beginning so there's no chaos he said there's nothing like it and there's no istidlal you know, istidlal meaning is there something that you can possibly derive this meaning from he said there's no istidlal either there's nothing which could suggest the celebrating of the Prophet so there's no precedent for us to base something on and there's nothing in meaning like this in the Sharia at all now there's another thing that the Shaykh has not mentioned here now, it's very important for us, is a principle called istishab. Istishab with a salt, istishab. The meaning of istishab with the, the scholars of Usul is now, if something has been done by the Prophet ﷺ in his time, is that precedent for us now as well? So if the Prophet ﷺ did something in his time, the companions did something in their time, does that mean we can still do that now? The majority of the scholars say yes, this is Dalil. The Hanafi scholars said this is not Dalil. We need to have Dalil to say that what they did applies to us. Does this make sense? That the, the hukum still remains today. You need to have proof to say that the hukum still remains today. Otherwise it's specific to the Prophet and it's specific to the companions. An everyday example of this, not everyday example, but a well-known example known by the scholars is Salat al istisqa With the Hanafi Madhab they don't have Salat al istisqa why? Because of his tishab. They said that the Prophet ﷺ did it. There's no proof for us to say that we can carry on this tradition. Therefore, it's something for the time of the Prophet, and we don't do it. Because there's no delil to say that we can do it after the generation of the Prophet ﷺ. Why is this important? This is important because had it even been 
established at the time of the Prophet ﷺ that they, pro- they practice his the celebrating of his birthday, we would need proof to say that it continued. Does that make sense? So even if the Prophet ﷺ did it, even if the Khulafa Rashidun did it, where is the proof to say that you can do it? This is what the Hanafi Madhav says. Okay? And we've given an example of that. Um, also, there's another point that stems <coughs> off this issue of istishab, which is very, very delicate. And this is what the Sheikh is talking about. He's talking about some things that which are technical. And this is how we can derive rulings. This is what the, the Mujtahid goes through. He looks at the Quran, looks at the Sunnah, then he looks at Qiyas, then he looks at Ijma, then he looks at the, the statements of the companions, then he looks at istidlal. Is there a way that he. Then he looks at istishab. There are different components and different tools that he can use. But here, there is no precedence. And also, from istishab, the scholars have said, that the asal is that we don't do it. The asal is that we don't do it. So now, if a person comes and says, I want to pray six raka'at for dhuhr. I want to pray six raka'at for dhuhr. What's the dalil? He has to provide the dalil. He can't say, well, there's no dalil for me to say not to do it. La, istishab. Did the Prophet do it in his time? If he did it in his time, then we can do it. If he didn't do it in his time, then you have to bring the dalil. And if you're not bringing the dalil, then it's not legislated. So this point of istishab is very, very important. From the Hanafi aspect, from their madhab, which we respect and we love and we can benefit from. But clearly, celebrating the time of the, Prophet, uh, the, the birthday of the Prophet is not legislated according to their own madhab. And this is well known in the books of Rasul. And also, a well known principle that all the madhab agreed upon, which is, if you want to practice something, where is your dalil? Therefore, the first time such a, such a celebration was practiced was some 600 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet in the 7th century. Thus, none of the scholars have denied the mode of being an innovation. Uh, so now, the scholars have differed, or the historians have differed, I should say, as to who is the one who invented it. Uh, Imam Shokani has gone with the Suyuti opinion, which he has a book. Suyuti is actually a supporter of the Mawlid. Uh, and he, as well as the Shulkani, have said that the first person to introduce it was a man called Sultan al Mudaffar. Others from the historians, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Kathir, Imam Zahabi, said it was a person from the Ubaidiyun, known as the Fatimids, basically a Shia uh, caliphate. And this came at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th century. And just to give you an idea of what these people believed in, is that they believed that the Qur'an was not complete. They believed that Jibreel, or Allah, made a mistake in giving the Qur'an to Muhammad. It should have been given to Ali. They believed that Aisha did very, very bad things with other men. They believed that Abu Bakr wanted to take power, and he took power forcefully, over Ali. They believe that Umar uh, had feelings for other men. I'm just trying to censor this here. It's a lot worse. They, uh, I mean, the, the, the list is endless. Some of them believe that Ali was the son of God. Some of them believe that Ali was God. Some of them believe that Ali has the power to control Rububiyyah, the control. Some of them believe that Ali, as well as the Imams that came after Ali, have the power to control. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the Aqeedah that these people were upon. Now what they said, and uh, the, the, uh, Imam Ibn Kathir, I'm mentioning here from Bidai wa Nihaya, he said that none of the fuqaha and muhadithun were with them. They come up with this idea, and they said, look, we're going to celebrate the Prophet's birthday, the, the Christians do it, Muhammad has more right to it, so we're going to do that. And the Fuqaha and the Muhaddithun, they were not with them. And as we will see in the, what Imam Ash-Shawkani says, he lists a, a list of fatawa from the ulama mentioned at that time, completely rejected. They wrote against the rulers at that time. But he goes on to say, Ibn Kathir, he said, it was corrupt rulers who introduced it. <coughs> corrupt rulers. This is very important because we're going to come back to this. Corrupt rulers who had kufr. Some of them were atheists. They were clear atheists. They said, we didn't believe in Allah. And some of them actually apostated from Islam and they went back to fire worship. They became open majusi'een. 
Ibn Kathir mentioned this in Bidawa al Nihayah. What did they do? The first time they said, uh, had the Milad al Nabi, they said, right, we're going to have a big party and a big feast. The feast had 10,000 chickens, 100,000 bowls of soup and different things, 30,000 platters of sweets, sweet dishes. And he mentions that they sang and danced from Fajr until Dhuhr on that day. They danced and sang from Fajr until Dhuhr. And this, the point here is that there's been a khilaf between the scholars of who was the person who introduced it. Uh, Sheikh Ismail Ansari and Sheikh uh, Salih Husaymi have said that this is the correct opinion. This is what uh, history tells us that the, the people who introduced it were this, these despicable people with these despicable aqidah. They wanted to, do, to imitate the, the Christians, and this is how they did it. Now, this is very important for two reasons. Firstly, they claim that Ibn Kathir has a book which supports the Milad or the Mawlid. Here, clearly, in Bidaw al Nihaya, something which is very, very established as a work of his, he completely outrights it. And he says that they were, they were corrupt. Uh, they had kufr, they had atheism, and he's refuting it. Uh, and the second point here is that they claim, as we will see, that celebrating the milad doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do something bad. You can remember the Prophet, you can use the day to study the seerah, etc. So we'll come back to this, inshallah. Based on these facts, the person who believes it to be permissible to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, knowing it to be an innovation and that all forms of innovation are misguidance, then they have become misguided by the very statement of Al-Mustafa, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. They are only introducing something which will oppose his purified sharia. Okay, so here again we're talking about how to derive still. We're talking about now definitions. What is an innovation the Shaykh is saying here? He's saying that if you knowingly go against the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu or you know that you're introducing something into the Sharia new, which has no precedence, then this is an innovation. And this is what uh, Ash-Shatibi says in the Itisam. And he has a very good definition. He says that anything that is introduced as a new act of worship or something which is introduced into the Sharia but not necessarily an act of worship or something which has no basis at all from the Quran and the Sunnah, this is an innovation. So if you're introducing something as a new act of worship, so if we say, for example, let's pray five for Dhuhr, let's pray six for Dhuhr, Bid'ah. If you're introducing something new into the Sharia, even if you say it's not an act of worship, practicing the, the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu And he actually mentions that as an example. He actually mentions that in Al-Itisam 137 to 39, that uh, you can introduce something into the Sharia, but you could claim that it's not an act of worship, but still it's a Bid'ah. And something which has no basis at, at all. And maybe we can even apply that aspect of the definition to the Milad. Now, he carries on in another place to say that there are three types of coming up with a ruling. The first type is where you have a mujtahid and he gets the dalil and he derives an opinion from that dalil. Either maybe something quite clear from the Quran and Sunnah, or he has to derive it. So this becomes a, a valid area of ijtihad. This becomes a valid area of ijtihad. So for example, somebody says, um, uh, How many raka'at are there, rawat ibn a day? Some narrations say 10, some narrations say 12. It could be a scholar says, 10 is the correct opinion. Another one says, 12 is a correct opinion. This one is narrated by Ibn Umar, and this has been narrated by Aisha. So now we can say, خلاص, this two valid opinions. We respect it. That doesn't necessarily mean that we follow both of them. We have to follow which we think is correct, or what the scholar explains us to be correct. This is the first type of dera- or coming, or how rulings come up in the Sharia. Re- respectable ijtihad. Another way is where you have something which is khilaf sunnah. So somebody does something which is against the sunnah. It has a precedence, but it's not the sunnah. An example of this is somebody wants to do du'a, not in congregation, du'a after the salat uh, wajib. So we'll say, this is khilaf sunnah. This is not what the Prophet did. 
Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قَدَيْتُمُ السَّلَا فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ When you have finished your prayer, remember Allah. The Prophet ﷺ explained, and the companions explained, how to remember Allah. To be with uh, if somebody does this one off, maybe twice, then we'll say, Akhi, you've gone against the sunnah, but you've not, you've not introduced something new <coughs> into the religion. Or when there's something, another way, uh, uh, an opinion can arise, is when something has no dalil whatsoever, or it has a weak dalil. Now this is the worst category, because this is a bid'ah. And this is what the Shaykh is saying here. When there is no delil, there is no Quran, there is no Sunnah, there is no Qiyas, there is no Istidlal, there is no Istisab as we've added, then this is clearly an innovation and you're going against what Al-Mustafa came with in this purified Sharia. Now, there's a very important point here, is that now they're going to talk about, okay, there is no delil, but who needs delil? There is, we can have an innovation, but it could be a good innovation. The only proof they may perhaps rely on is the fact that some scholars have divided innovations into various types. However, this again has no real tangible proof to help establish it. Therefore, I cannot accept the opinion of those who hold it to be hold it to hold it permitted to innovate such a practice or use innovative principles to try to support it. Except until they are able to cl uh, present clear proof. To authenticate such an innovation. Okay, so now the argument now is evolving. They're saying, okay, we have no delil, but we don't need delil. We can introduce something new into the religion because it's something that is good. Uh, we will say in response to this, uh, there are two ways, or maybe even three ways of response to this. Firstly, this is a qa'idah, and a qa'idah is not delil in itself. Qawaid is not Quran and Sunnah. So if somebody comes up with a qa'idah, it's what they understand from the sharia. And this qa'idah is not always applicable, number one. And number two, it's not delil in itself. So for example, if you say, uh, I prayed salah, but I didn't have the intention. I didn't have the intention to pray, I just prayed. I prayed four rakah, I had no intention to pray dhuhr. Purposely, I had no intention. I mean, the scholars say that your, your actions are your intention. Fair enough. But this person will say that, okay, for example, let's change it. I prayed for Ruka in Zuhur behind the Imam with the purpose in, purposeful intention of making it a nafil. So now what we will say to this person, that you have not prayed Zuhur. You have prayed something which is not Zuhur. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ Not that the qaida itself, al-umur bimaqasidiha, is the dalil. This is a qa'idah for us to understand the sharia, not that it's proof in itself, number one. So if we have a thing which is bid'at al-hasana, it's a qa'idah, it's not dalil. You still need to provide dalil. Number two, uh, splitting the bid'ah into different categories is there in the book of, books of the, some of the ulama. It is, it is present. But these people are not applying it properly. What they mean is bidat al hasana, bidat al makruha, bidat al haram, or bidat which is muharrama, bidat al mustahabba, bidat al wajiba. They've classified it according to these five. Bidat could be wajib, could be obligatory, it might be recommended form of bidat. It could be a permissible type of bidat, which is what they're trying to say here. It could be a makruh type of bidat, it could be a haram type of bidat. What they've said is that this bidat actually has an asal in the sharia. It has an asal in the sharia. And I'm going to quote here uh, Ibn Izzal Hanafi, because I think it's quite appropriate that we quote him here. He said that bid'ah mubaha is maslaha al mursala. The meaning of bid'ah mubaha is maslaha al mursala. What's the meaning of maslaha mursala? It means that something already has a precedence in the sharia. This is the terminology used by the scholars of Sur. Maslaha mursala is that if something is in the sharia, the understanding is there initially, you've got dalil for it, but you apply something which the dalil doesn't talk about. An example of this, everyday example of this, is red lights. What's the dalil that I have to stop at a red light? Do I need dalil to stop at a red light? I don't need to. Why? Because the asal here is that we need to protect the life of other people, we need to respect the laws of, of, of the highway, etc. So the point here is, this would be classed as a bid'ah mubah because it already has a precedence in the sharia. Not that you're introducing something new 
as Dalil or an act of worship. And so this is what he means by uh, Bid'a Mubaha. And this is what Shatibi mentions in Iqtisam. He's saying that these people who are trying to categorize Bid'a into these five different types are doing it incorrectly because the people who themselves categorize it, categorize it when there is an asal for it. Another example of this, Ibn Abidin from the Hanafi Madhab, he wrote in his Hashiya that it could be wajib, it could be wajib, uh, a wajib form of bid'ah, if you are to review, refute innovators. Refute innovators. Why? Because the innovation is new. The innovation is new. But the asal is already there. So if somebody comes out and says, for example, any kind of innovation, for example, if somebody says that men and women are completely equal in every single right, and this is, I've, I firmly believe this in the Sharia. We talked about this last time, uh, that Islam says we give equality in certain things and we give responsibility in certain things. But if he says no, khalas, equality in every single right, we will say to him that now you need to sit with this person and you need to explain that this is not how Islam looks at gender roles. Women have their role, men have their role, they have their responsibility. They're equal in certain things, they're not equal in certain things. The man has more of a responsibility over the women in many issues. And the women have it easier in many issues. And the Sharia supports the women more than it supports the men in many issues. So it's not that Islam is being oppressive towards women. It's not that Islam necessarily sees men being better than women in all circumstances. But the point here is not equality, the point here is responsibility. That should be the word, injustice. No, the point here is now, is we're going to sit with this person and talk about this new shubha, this new innovation that's come in. This becomes wajib for us. So he's saying that the asal is already there. We have to explain what the Quran and Sunnah has already said. But the new innovation needs to be refuted. This is the meaning of bid'ah or wajib. So the point here is that they've categorized them incorrectly. As for taking the opinion of such and such scholar or such and such individual, then this is not academic. The truth is greater than the statement or opinion of any scholar. If you were to make rulings based on the statements of scholars alone, without any evidence, then in actual fact, we will be basing our rulings on hearsay and anecdotes. So none can, can permit such an innovation except those who have anomalies from Muslims. So now the Sheikh is saying here um, that we cannot follow people just for the sake of following them. So why do you follow the Mawlid? Because Pir Sab said. Or why do you follow the Mawlid? Because it's just what Sheikh said. That, that's not the reason. Now, uh, it's very important because what this means is, if you're following this man, what this means is, is that this person represents the Sharia in every single way. And this is not possible. Ibn Mundir said that it is not possible. It is not possible. It's impossible that the Sunnah exists completely in one man. It's not possible. How can the whole of the Sunnah exist in this one? The meaning here, as Shaqiti mentioned in Adwal Bayan, that the whole of the Quran and the Sunnah cannot be gathered in one man, in all of his opinions. It's not possible. There's going to be some opinions that he's wrong in. So the point here is, whatever he follows from the Quran and the Sunnah and is correct in his istidlal and the understanding of the religion, then we follow that. But if he makes a mistake, then we have to clearly say that we respect him, we have still love for him, but he's made a mistake. And that applies to every single person. But if somebody was to say, that I'm following this madhab because, I'm, because this is the correct madhab. I'm, following, I'm a Hanafi because a Hanafi madhab is completely correct. I'm a Shafi because Shafi is completely correct. This is wrong. Because it's not possible for the whole of the Sunnah and the Quran to be gathered in the <coughs> one or Imam Shafi, or Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed. We love them, but they're going to be right in some things, they're going to be wrong in some things. So now the Sheikh is saying here, even if your Sheikh is telling you to celebrate it, that's not a proof. There's no, there's, so now we have no proof in the Quran and Sunnah, you've not understood Bid'at al Hasina correctly, and now you're making taqlid of your Imam or your Sheikh inappropriately. So, as to what is pure and noble, i.e. the way of the seller and those who follow them, then one will not be able to find from them a single utterance to support this innovation. Rather, their statements are all in agreement that anything invented into the religion is an innovation. It is from the most contemptible vices which lead the Sharia becoming eroded to corruption. For this reason, you will see this land, Yemen in the time of the Sheikh, bearing the fruits of its being purified from the cult, 
the Sufis. Those who practice wicked actions introduced in, in the religion and all praise are due to Allah. Alhamdulillah. So now here, this is the conclusion of the first part. The Shaykh is saying there is no delil. And you, you, those people who are pure in their intention, who have noble intentions, who want to do the right thing, will never support this kind of innovation because there is no delil. We've, we've completely established that the Quran, Sunnah, and Qiyas, Istidlal, Istishab, the actual date, historically, all of it is incorrect. The actual meaning of a birthday is not something Islamic. It's actually, it has shirk involved. So those people who are pure and who have sincerity in their heart will realize this and they will leave the action. And this is why Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn al Wahhab, starts Qawai al-Arba with a very, very important point. He said, and this is very valid today as well, he said that if you have tahar, you have a bottle of water, you have clean clothes, one bit of najasa falls on it, what do people do? Some of them completely take their thumb off and put it in the washing machine. All they need to do is clean that one spot. But what they will do is they will completely get rid of the, the garment. And the Yahud in their, in their Sharia had to cut off the garment. If Najasa falls on your sleeve or any other, you have to throw it away. You can't wash it. It's not possible for you to wash it. This is the ghulu that they went into when it comes to Najasa and Tahara or the lack of Tahara uh, in these physical aspects. But what about that? <coughs> The, the spiritual aspect the shaykh is saying here if you are pure in your heart if you want to do the right thing then you will not accept this kind of najasa to come into your spirituality after his introduction eventually the practice of mawlid and the khalif al-mahdi al-din al-abbas ibn mansur may allah have mercy on him was eradicated he banned the mawlid and he ordered that tombs and shrines that the people had become devoted to be destroyed and leveled. He returned the nation back to Allah, the Most High, and to follow the path of the Salaf al Salih, the pious predecessors. There's a, there's a point here that the Ummah went through a very difficult stage before Shokani and after Shokani. There were, there were shirk that was being involved uh, at the time of the Mawlid, and like we've seen that these people were clearly atheists, some of our major shirk, made, and they introduced something which is a major sin that everybody had to. Uh, take part in. Bid'ah is a major sin. So the point here is that the Ummah goes through these you know, cycles. It gets purified if we purify ourselves. And this is what happened. This is what the Shaykh is saying here. That um, uh, Mahdi al-Din Abbas came and for this reason you will see this land, Yemen, in the time of the Shaykh bearing the fruits of being purified from the cult of the Sufis. How did this come about? It only came about through support in Iman, in ilm, in action, in sabr, in da'wah, in doing the right thing, in being united as a, as a community. But if we look at history, we, we still have to be optimistic about the Ummah today. Many people are saying that you know the Ummah is going to go through a lot of trials. Some people are very pessimistic about the future. You know, things are going to happen, it could be genocide could be left lawless, could be left without land. The Muslim lands going through trouble and tyranny for many, many years. But if you look at the, 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 the history and the cycle of this Ummah, Allah has always given us this, especially if, when we go back to our religion. So when Imam Shokani came, he purified it with the, with the help of Allah. And after the help of Allah, Mahdi ad din and then the likes of Imam Shokani gave da'wah to the people, look what happened to Yemen. Look what happened to Najd and Saudi Arabia. Until today, Imam Abdul Wahhab, 200, over 200 years ago, his da'wah is still relevant on our bookshelves today. Look at the barakah. If we make our iman strong, we have ikhlas, we push forward and we be pessimistic, optimistic. We be optimistic, then Allah will aid. Sparks of innovation spread like wildfire, especially the innovation of the Mawlid, because the masses, from the common folk are always alert to, to innovation and at times gain a passion for it. This is the important point that <coughs> mankind gravitate generally towards sin. And it's very important for us to understand now with social media, movies, and music. Mankind will, if you look at all these music and everything that's going on, they will entice you with the biggest of sins. So some of the biggest blockbuster movies have shirk as their plot. 
I don't know, I don't really watch movies, but you know, magicians and that kind of stuff. Or you watch the movie because she's beautiful. Zina. Or you watch it because it's an action packed movie. Why? Because everyone's getting killed. Kabair after Kabair. This is what entices people to watch and be attracted to these things. The Sheikh is saying the same thing here. Why did Milad al Nabi or Mawlid al Ihtifal and Mawlid al Nabi become prevalent? Because people they didn't want to worship Allah. They didn't want to come to the masjid. They'd much rather go eat the chickens and have the sweet plants. Most lay people only follow that which, which leads to degeneracy and they take up all paths to achieve its aims. They divulge in whatever is haram, prohibited, until they end up falling into immorality, similar to the implications found with the celebration of isn't, the Mawlid. Isn't this happening today with social media, and like we were saying before? Uh, people are following what it becomes degenerate. I mean, the meaning degenerate is when people are becoming corrupt. The whole generation is becoming uh, corrupt and lawless in their own lives. You can do whatever you want. And it becomes a very, very big problem. And all the paths are taken to achieve this aim. Anything to fulfill your desires, you will do. SubhanAllah, if you look at the time of the Salaf. Now, if I explain to you, for example, this is your mobile phone and you've lost it. So how, I think some reports said that there were people who wanted to commit suicide because they didn't have their phone for one day or a few hours. There was a report like that. Now, take that a step further. Take that a step further. If I say to you, okay, I know where your phone is. I can help you cure yourself. Stop being crazy. I know where your phone is. It's in Manchester. Your phone is in Manchester. How many people would drive to Manchester? How many people? Clearly people are addicted to this thing. So the point here, the Sheikh is also making here that anything to achieve this aim will be done. People go majnoon, they go crazy behind following their desires. So whoever is able to attend these celebrations from people of knowledge and that their word will be, will be accepted by them, then he should explain to them their wrongdoing, even though it may seem like they are doing something commendable. He must preach to laymen and those who are misguided. He must try all means to distance them from this innovation and show rejection of it. And by this, they can advise the general masses to leave the opinions of the person they are, blind, they are, they are blindly following. Some of, some, of, some of even believing that their pious saints visit them during these celebrations. Uh, so now the Sheikh is talking about what is our attitude towards those people who celebrate the, the Milan and Nabi. Firstly, we need to be sincere to ourselves and follow the correct opinion. The second thing is that we must advise other people and explain to them why it is incorrect. And the Sheikh in the end gives you a very nice summary as to maybe eight or nine points as to why we believe that practicing this as a, as a festival is wrong. But also there's a very important point here, which I, I think is most important from this paragraph, is the issue of sitting with people who are deemed as being innovators. Unfortunately, we're living in a time now that if you get even walking, seen walking with a person who is not of a particular label, then you will be labeled with the label with that person is on. And unfortunately, this has become a plague. It's become a very big problem. So how can Imam Ashokani tell you to go sit with a Sufi? How is that possible? That would mean that you're aiding the innovator, that would mean that you yourself would be an innovator, you would be guilty by association and sitting with them. No, this is not the correct understanding. The understanding here is that the sitting with the innovator takes from the ahkam al-khams. It can be maybe wajib, it can maybe mustahab, it could be maybe mubah, it could be makru, it could be maybe haram. And the haram one is what you find many of the books of the Aqeed are talking about. When you're sitting with them, when you're aiding them, when you're taking knowledge from them, this is what it means. Imam Malik said, لا يهل لأحد أن يقيم بأرض يحب يسب فيها الصرف يسب فيها Imam Malik said, لا يهل لأحد It is not permissible for anybody أن يقيم بأرض for him to even be in a place, let alone sitting with people, be in a place, يسب فيها الصرف that the salaf are being insulted in. Now, Imam Malik is giving us that this is the qa'idah, that you are not allowed to sit with such people. And Ibn al-Arabi explains this further. He said, هذا صحيح فإن المنكر إذا لم تقدر أو تقدر أن تغيره فزلعن 
Ibn al-Arabi was from the, the, the ulama of the Malikiyah and obviously a, a very big uh, giant when it comes to Aqidah and Tafsir and Lugha. He said that if you, are, if you are able to change it, then you have to sit with them. But if you are not able, then you make bara from them. So if the understanding was that we sit with innovators, by default you'd be a mubtadir, then this is incorrect. So the, the correct understanding is that you show support with them, this is what is haram. If you take knowledge from them, this is what is haram. And Imam Sa'aboon, he mentions this in uh, Aqeelah Ahmad Sunnah. Uh, Ibn Qudama mentions this in his book Aqeelah as well. And Shaykh Rabi also mentions this in Usul Al-Sunnah of Imam Ahmad. Uh, and page number eight, he said that the meaning of sitting with the innovators is when you're sitting them to aid them. And he himself, when he went to Kenya, he sat with Sufis. And he, by the fadl of Allah, helped guide many to come back to the correct way. And Shaykh Allah, Shaykh uh, Rahman Nasr Barraq was the one who gave us the fa'idah that it comes in the al khams. Sometimes it could be wajib, like this scenario. Sometimes it could be mustahab. Now, if, for example, your father or your mother is a big innovator, a very big innovator, are you going to say it's harm for you to sit with them? And if you sit with them, you become a Sufi. It's a completely incorrect understanding of the religion. Where is the honor of our religion? If the religion disappears, then where would our modesty, piety, and intellect go? Do they not realize that lay people will accept these practices which will lead to all forms of immorality? They will adopt any measure to celebrate this event in the name of enjoyment. So now this is the, the Shaykh is saying that this is the conclusion or this is the effects of bid'ah. Uh, so somewhat we're going back towards the usul. So now here the Shaykh is saying that uh, bid'ah can only have negative consequences. So even if you're saying that it's a good bid'ah, then we will not agree with this by your definition because, like we said, good bid'ah still has to have an asal. But also, we, when we're introducing something new, we still have to look at the consequences. Now, Imam al-Shatibi says in Layt Sam, Layt Sam is a four-volume book which deals with just bid'ah, different qawaid connected to bid'ah, at al bid'ah, how bid'ah comes about, etc. And he says in this book that one of the biggest negative consequences when it comes to in introducing something new it, into the Sharia is that it replaces something that is already has a precedence. So this is what he's saying, that when you introduce new things into the religion, where's your honor going to go? Your religion is going to leave. If you're going to introduce this now, you can introduce anything. You can start playing around with the Sharia. He also said that that when you introduce innovations, it always is driven by desires. There is no other reason for you to innovate something new into the Sharia. The Sharia is complete. And the only reason why somebody would innovate something new into the Sharia is because if he has an agenda behind it. And like we said last time, the stages of uh, innovation or the stages of falsehood spreading are four. And this is what Ibn Qayyim said last time. First off, it starts off with a seed of innovation. So the person says, let's pray six rakat for Duhan. Every, every day. Or let's practice the, 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 the birthday of the Prophet. ﷺ. This is bid'ah. Everybody, the Muslim community, will reject it. You can't pray six for Dhuhr. There's no delay for it. You can't practice the, 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 the celebrating of the Prophet's birthday. If this stage withstands the resistance, then it becomes a firya and it becomes attributed to the religion. So now people actually believe that this is part of the religion. Then there becomes a stage of shak. That's what Ibn Qayyim says. So it starts off with the seed, then it gets a bit bigger, and people try to start justifying it. Then it becomes a doubtful area. So some people, now it becomes as if it's a valid opinion. This sheikh has this opinion. There's no delay for it. No, 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 but people will be talking about it. That means it must be in the Sharia. And people do this with the nasheeds today. They say that music has been in the Ummah through so many caliphates. It was even played in the masjids. So how can you turn around and say now that, uh, you know, uh, music's haram? Caliphs did it. Pious people did it. Who they deem as pious. So now it becomes a doubtful area. It becomes an area of shak. And then, once you cannot revolt or refute that shak, it becomes an issue of taqlid. You follow your opinion, I follow my opinion. These are the stages of Dalala and falsehood uh, evolving itself. <coughs> Fadl, 
from this, we realize the mistake that some have fallen into when they claim that these celebrations are only a praiseworthy event of dhikr and sharing of food between Muslims. There is no harm in this, they claim. Just because you are celebrating the Mawlid, it doesn't mean anything haram will take place, they say. We say celebrating the Mawlid is an innovation. This is something you admit to. And thus innovations can only increase a person in what is foul and immoral. It is a means, of, it is a means to corruption, rather, saying the Mawlid is prohibited involves both gatherings where you think nothing wrong will happen with gatherings which are clear in its misconduct. Okay, so now we've already established that it's an innovation and they're clearly claiming, and they're not claiming anything otherwise, they're clearly admitting it's an innovation. Now the Sheikh is saying that you already admit that it's an innovation, so we're on the same level here. Now the Sheikh is saying that we have to look at the consequences of practicing this festival. Because the Sharia takes the means towards something as very, very something which is very important. So something might be halal, but if it leads to something which is haram, then it's haram. Or something might be halal, or might be haram, but it could be lead to something that you need to do out of the Ruriyat, then it becomes. So we need to look at the end objective. Now before the Shaykh goes into uh, what they call uh, Sadda Dariya, uh, there's something else that Shaykh Islam mentions, which is an even more stronger proof. So A is an innovation, but B, the definition of a festival refutes what they say. <coughs> now the, shaykh, the, 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 the ulama agreed that Eid is part of every religion. Eids are part of every festival, the part of every religion. But what is Eid? Uh, Eid is something which annually reoccurs itself. This is by definition. Eid Ya'ud. Kul sana. Eid Ya'ud. So that's why it's called Eid. Every Eid comes around again. So this now has been is part of religion, whether you claim it's part of religion or not. Number one. Number two, Eid or festivals are always connected to acts of worship. So after fasting we have fitr. After hajj we have sacrifice. So whether you admit it or not, festivals are connected to acts of worship. The third thing, and Allah talks about this quite clearly in the Quran, that festivals are parts of worship, because Allah says in the Quran, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ That every single ummah has its festivals. The Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr that we have our own festivals. When he came to Medina, he said we have two and that's enough. We don't need a third one. Clearly showing that this Ummah only has two. And Allah also says in Surah Ma'idah, لِكُلِّ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْ هَاجَا And the scholars have explained, the scholars of Tafsir have said that every single Ummah has a shir'a, a sharia and minhaj. And this includes festivals. This includes festivals. Another point here connected to having an annual gathering or annual festival is that anything which is repeated uh, itself, like we said before, uh, is classed as an Eid, is classed as a festival. And the, the Ibn Qayyim mentions this, that the dalil for this is the Prophet ﷺ said, La, la taj'al qabri Eida. He supplicated to Allah and he said, Oh Allah, don't make my grave a place of frequent uh, visitation. Eida, he's mentioned Eida. So the, the point here, Ibn Qayyim is mentioning in Ghafil Afhan, that something which you would, even if it's not annual, if you're taking this as a ritual that is happening every cycle, then it's a festival and it's part of the Sharia. So now we have, it's an innovation, you don't have any dalil. If you're introducing something which is going to be held every single year, and on top of that you attribute it to the religion, but even if you didn't, it's still a festival. It's still something which is haram. So if somebody was to turn around and say birthdays, I'm not doing it to celebrate, I'm not doing it to worship. Not, we will say, no, it's still a eat, it's still recurring itself. So now he's saying a principle known as blocking the means. A principle known as blocking the means is a principle which takes objectives of the Shia and thought or means that lead to whatever that is not principle. This, this principle is extremely important to which the majority of the scholars have agreed to and adopted. If all of this becomes clear to you, if you have a shred of justice within you, you will not disagree to what is being said here. We have explained above that none of the people of the household of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, ever permitted the Mawlid. And this is likewise upon you, if you are just, 
to know that evidences and arguments presented by those who reject such a celebration. Okay, so now uh, the Sheikh is saying that we have uh, a new way, which is Sadhriya, uh, which is to block the means. And Imam uh, is, is Ibn uh, Abdul Salam al Hanafi, I'm again quoting him because he's very, very relevant in this whole argument, uh, mentions in his book of Qawaid that uh, deciphering between the greater good and the, the lesser of the two evils is a symbol of Islam. It's a symbol of Islam. So to block the path to which it would create a greater harm or to open the path which is, has a greater good is a symbol of Islam. It's part of the Sharia. And the reason for this is to stop facade from spreading if the thing is bad and to incite the good which if it may be something which is good. So, so we say to you, condoner of the Mawlid, if you have, you have agreed with us that there's a scholarly, scholarly consensus that the Mawlid is an innovation. It was introduced by kings in the 7th century and it was only after then did people believe it to be part of the religion and adopted, adopted by religious personalities. After it became apparent, the scholars authored books in rejection for such an innovation from them Include. Yeah. Tajuddin al Fakihani was one of the first people from the Maliki Madhab. He was an Imam from uh, the Maliki Madhab and he wrote uh, a fatwa straight away showing you, uh, showing the people why uh, this is wrong and he, in it he described and exposed his wickedness. In the above book, there is also a fatwa by Fakihani Sheikh. So even his Sheikh wrote a book, Ibn Taqiq al-Eid, who is very well known, inshallah, uh, from Ahl sunnah uh, Imam Abu Abdullah bin Hajj, the Faqih of Egypt, in his time, wrote a book called Madkhal fi Amal al-Mawlid. Imam Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Jazari, from the Shafi Madhab, wrote a book, Ta'rif bil-Mawlid al-Sharif. Imam, Imam Hafid al-Shams al-Din Nasir al-Din al-Dimishki wrote Mawlid uh, al-Sadi fi Mawlid al-Hadi. So if you look at them, I mean, they completely came out with it straight away. 734 after Hijri, 702 after Hijri, 737, uh, something as early as 660. So towards the end of the 6th or the 7th century and the beginning of the 8th century, they completely rejected it. And also a nukta here is that um, all of them are talking about Mawlid, they don't say Milad. So going back to what we were saying before about the correct way of pronouncing uh, or the using this uh, terminology, we would say that Mawlid is a bit better. Uh, and some of these, and Suyuti's book as well, and some of these books clearly describe the prohibition or the innovation of Mawlid, while some of them seek to permit it. So now, as like we said here, that the Sheikh is saying that some of these books refute the idea. Some of them say that it's permissible. The point here is we're making a bath, we're making a research, we're giving both sides their chance to come up with their delil. So that's why the Sheikh said in the beginning, where's your delil? Where's the Quran? Where's the Sunnah? Where's the Stidlal? Where's the Qiyas? Where's this, this? If you don't have any of this, then let's move on to the next stage. Historically, where does it come from? Then if we move on to the next stage, what is the, what is the implication of us doing this? Let's say for argument's sake, let's do it. What happens afterwards? The Sharia takes that into consideration also. So the Sheikh is saying it. some of these books are refuting it and some of them are in promotion of it. Um, but they are all agreed that it is an innovation. It, it wasn't at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, and they admit that there is no support for the Mawlid when it comes to evidence. They admit this. Now this is very important because now they will, they will say this to you as well, that it is, you know, is, there is no Dalil, but we use Qiyas. We can use Qiyas. You know, if we say, for example, the Eid, or something we respect, or some event that happened in the Seerah, these events show that the life of the Prophet ﷺ need to be honoured. So now let's have a celebration based on doing this. <coughs> okay, so now the Sheikh is going to talk about the evidences they use based on Qiyas. So there's two main areas, that, or two main arguments that they come with to use as proof for the Mawlid. Now, before we go into this, it is well known, and there is no disagreement from the scholars on this. All the scholars of the Sul and the Madahib are agreed that you cannot do Qiyas to create a new act of worship. It's not possible. Why? Qiyas can only be done if you have an Asl. And then you need to make a far. Uh, you need to make a new ruling. You have an Asl ruling, you need to make a new ruling. Another principle for Qiyas, 
and one of the conditions of Qiyas is you need to know the hukum. If you don't know the hukum, you can't make Qiyas. And you need to know the illa. Why does this thing in the asal have that ruling? If you don't know the illa, there is no Qiyas. I'll give you an example. Khamar is haram. Khamar is haram. Why? Because of iska. It intoxicates. What's the asal? The asal is khamar. You have to leave for it. Kulli muskirin. Haram. Prophet said anything that intoxicates, haram. This is the asal. What was he talking about? He was talking about what they had at that time. He wasn't talking about crack, cocaine, heroin. He wasn't talking about it. It wasn't, it wasn't available. He talking about alcohol. This is the asal. Now we need to apply modern day drugs. We need a hukum on it. We don't have any dalil. Do we have an asal? Yes, we do. Intoxication is there at the time from Prophet. Okay, so now we have something which is similar. What's the hukum on this one? The first one, haram, tahrim, we can't do it. So now, this would be haram, the second one, are drugs. If it passes the fourth test, and the fourth test is, does it intoxicate? If it intoxicates, then it's haram, just like alcohol. If it doesn't intoxicate, then it's not haram. So now cigarettes. Can we make a chaos between alcohol and cigarettes? The illa is different. It doesn't intoxicate. It doesn't cloud your judgment. Haram for other reasons, but it's not the same as intoxication. Ibadah, you can't do that. So we say, for example, we have dhuhr, four rakah. We want to make a new salah, a sixth one, in the day, so we can maybe have it in the evening. What is the hukum? Wajib. What is the illa? To worship Allah. You can't do that. You can't, you can't create a new religion. In this way So the scholars are agreed That when it comes to Acts of Ibadah uh, Tajuddin al-Subqi A very famous Shafi scholar Who was uh, Very very An authority in Usul He said It is not possible To make Qiyas In Acts of Worship Because Qiyas Requires a feature Which is a illa In which the analogy Is based upon Acts of Worship Don't have this uh, This this point Because Acts of Worship Can only be given to you By divine instruction only Allah and His Messenger can tell you how to worship. You can't create worship for yourself based on qiyas. So this is well known. So now for them to go into this field is very strange. It shows you that they are now looking for a way. So Some of these books clearly describe the prohibition of the innovation of the knowledge. It's just carrying from some of these, yeah. Some of them try to use the following some, evidences. Some of them try to use the following evidences. The hadith where the Prophet, peace, of, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, came to al Medina and he found the Jews fasting the day of Ashura. So he asked them about it. They replied by saying, We are fasting this day because it is the day in which Allah drowned Fir'aun and saved Musa. So he fast out of giving that of thanksgiving to Allah the Most High. And he specifying special acts of worship in thanks to Allah for the birth of the Prophet. Ibn Hajar and others also use a hadith in which states that the Prophet, peace and, of, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, gave haqiqa for himself after he became a Prophet. What's the point here? The point here is that when Allah saved Musa from Fir'aun, it was a day where thanks should be given. So they fasted. So if Allah saved Musa from Fir'aun, which is a miracle in itself, then the biggest miracle is the sending of the Prophet wasallam. so we should give thanks on that day. And they also use another point where the Prophet ﷺ did aqiqah for himself. How, what's, what's the point in this? It shows that the Prophet ﷺ recognized his own birth and he sacrificed a thanksgiving to Allah. So now they're using these two points to say that the Sharia has talked about giving thanks for a miracle and the Prophet ﷺ specifically gave thanks to Allah uh, by giving the aqiqah. Now, uh, the Shaykh of Shokani, I don't think he goes into uh, refuting this in detail, but uh, we can say that this is wrong for several reasons. First of all, the Prophet Sallallahu did this act to do aqiqah for himself because of the aqiqah, not to celebrate. Had celebrating his birthday of shukr been legislated he would have done it which was separate to the aqiqah 
That makes sense. If the Prophet wasallam wants to practice the celebrating or the thanks of being born, why did he wait 40 years plus to do that, number one? Number two, why did he do that after Aqiqa was legislated? The, the fact that he did the Aqiqa for himself shows that he's acting upon doing the Aqiqa. Not that he wants to pr pr give thanks for being born or holding that day of veneration. And we know that because his day wasn't preserved. He's only doing it to be born, not to celebrate the day he was born. Okay? And we know this even further because if it was out of a birthday, then he would have done it every year. He would have sacrificed a ram or cow or camel, whatever it was. He didn't. He only did it once. And some of the Mufassirun or some of the historians said that it wasn't done at his time and it's not befitting for the best of creation not to have an aqiqah. So he did it for himself and some of the ulama have taken the hukum that you can do it for yourself, you can do it after a lengthy period of time, it doesn't have to be after seven days. And there's many different fawaid from the Prophet ﷺ doing it. And it clearly shows that he's rahmatullah alameen, that the sharia is not so rigid. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says that aqiqah is not a proof for eat. Like we said, if the Prophet ﷺ did this to show you it's a festival, then he would have specified the day, he would have specified uh, the way, he would have specified how would you do this uh, annually. Also, it shows that there's a contradiction in your own argument. Because some of them say that we are only celebrating the day, the day of the Prophet's birth, not out of worship in itself. So then why are you using Aqiqah as argument? Aqiqah is a, a legislated act of worship. So you can't say, well, we're just doing it to get together or to remember the Prophet's life. It's not introducing anything new into the Sharia, but then you're using Aqiqah as proof. It doesn't work like that. This hadith is also used by Sufi, also in trying to prove the provability of the Mawlid. However, what is strange is that these two scholars are now guilty of supporting innovation. Innovation because, like we said before, as Shatabi said, that if you don't have Dalil, then it's an innovation, even if you are using a weak evidence. So now, for example, if somebody is using a hadith and he knows it's weak and he knows the argument is weak, but he's still basing a hook upon it, it's still bid'ah. Even if this person is a mujtahid, even if this person is a mujtahid. And an everyday example of this, I'm sure everybody's heard of it, is where Sheikh Al-Bani said, putting the hands on the chest after ruku is a bid'ah. Why? Because for him, he said there is no delay for it. So it doesn't even matter if Ibn Baz is saying what they mean saying, if the whole legend of Daima is saying it, with Albani, it's still a bid'ah. I respect them, I respect them for their opinion, but I hold this to be a bid'ah because there is no proof for it. So even if you bring proof for it, and I deem it as a mujtahid to be weak, then I can still see it as being a bid'ah. That's my opinion. This is what he is saying here. So now you are using hadith, which is sahih, you are using evidence which are authentic, no doubt about that, but you're using it incorrectly. Therefore, it's a, it's a bidah, even if it is sahih in itself. It's a very important point. There's another incident that they use when Abu Lahab, and I'm sure people have heard of this one, Abu Lahab manumated uh, a slave, or emancipated a slave, he freed a slave called Thuwaiba. And Thuwaiba was a wet nurse. She used to, you know, uh, breastfeed children. And the narration goes like this in Abdul Razak, a Muslim Abdul Razak, that Abu Lahab came to the dream of some people from Ahlul Bayt. And he said to the people in the dream that my adab has been lessened. So they said to him, why has it been lessened? He said, because on the day of the Prophet was in the birth, I freed a thwaib. So now Allah has had some mercy on me and I had my punishment reduced. Now this is what they use as proof to say that you can do good deeds on this day and you can use this day to celebrate the, the, the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Firstly, we will say that the hadith is weak because of Urwa narrates from the Prophet ﷺ and Urwa came way after the time of the companions. So there's a cut in the chain. Secondly, Urwa said some people from Ahlul Bayt, some people is Majhul. We don't know who these people are. Ahlul Bayt doesn't necessarily mean that they were Muslim. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were pious or Adil Dabit. And some of the, you know, the, the characteristics necessary for uh, a transmission to be correct. 
So there is somebody who is unknown here. Uh, also, the report doesn't give a specific date. So yes, he did it, but he didn't do it uh, every year. He didn't say that we're going to celebrate. It's just one off, just like the argument that we use with Aqiqa. And also, dreams are not proof for legislation. So Abu Zur al-Iraqi from the Aima of the Salaf said that if shaitan can take the form of anyone except the Prophet wasallam, then he's definitely going to take the, shaitan, the, 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 the form of Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab can definitely come to somebody in their dream and say, yeah, yeah, do this. He's the Fir'aun of this Ummah, as the Prophet ﷺ said. And this goes on to the next point, is that how is it possible that this hadith is sahih when Allah says, Tabbat ila abi lahabi wa tab. And the, the ulama of the Mufassirun have said that emphasis is given in this surah. Tabbat, perish, yada abi lahabi wa tab. It's even worse the punishment for him. How can this be lightened? And from the ulama have also said that this surah was revealed right at the beginning of the Ba'tha when the Prophet ﷺ went up to Safa and said, Ya Nas, fear Allah, if I was to tell you if there's an enemy coming, would you believe me? What did he say? He said, Tab, Ya Muhammad, Wailak, why have you called us here for this? So Allah revealed Tab Batiyada. Some of the have said that this shows you the correctness of Islam, it shows you the, the truthfulness of the Prophet. ﷺ. How so? For 23 years, or until when Abu Lahab died, all he had to say is, I believe in Muhammad. This would completely negate the, the truth of the, and, the, and the validity of the Qur'an. Because Allah already said that he's going to be punished with a severe punishment. And his wife. So all he had to say, he say, Muhammad is a liar because I'm a Muslim now. That's all he had to say. All he had to say is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad. So I believe, now what are you going to do with your Qur'an? But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. So this is the point. The point here is that you are trying to take this meaning away by this uh, by this incident of Huayba. We have love for the Prophet ﷺ. This man is an enemy of the Prophet It doesn't matter if he's his uncle. The Prophet ﷺ called him Fir'aun of this Ummah. We have to have enmity to this person. He tried to kill the Prophet ﷺ. He tried, his wife, Allah says in the, in the, in the surah, yeah, she used to, she used to like make uh, the, the life very hard for the Prophet ﷺ, physically attack him and, and, and tarnish his name. And Based on this, how can we say that this kafir, this kabith, this person who Iblis loves, has good deeds which will benefit him in the akhir? We know from the ayat and adillah from the Quran and the sunnah, if you die upon kufr, khalas, it's over. There's no, there's no chance for you to benefit from your good deeds. But you know, like uh, <coughs> Ali, Ali Rabbi's father has got a lesser punishment could, through some good actions. Could, could not apply to him. Ibn Hajr and the other ulama have said that this is khas for him. This is khas for Abu Talib. But some of the ulama as well, I think it's uh, Bayhaqi and others from the Salaf have said that it is possible for Allah, and I think Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Ibn Qayyim goes with this as well, that it is possible for a person to have his punishment reduced. But again, so somebody is, is deemed to eternal hellfire, to the bits, pits of the hellfire. But after some time, Allah lessens the punishment. Not taking him out. If he hasn't got Tawheed, then we know that he's never going to leave the fire. But it could be that this happens. This is possible. The majority of the ulama say no. This is just specific for Abu Talib. If you're in the fire, you're in the fire. Wherever you're decreed, wherever, wherever you're staying, that's it. Khalas. Uh, and and the, the level will not be reduced. Khilaf on this issue, this is not the issue. The point here is, is that how can you say that... Uh, this Khabith, this person, this evil person who hated Islam will have his re re punishment reduced because of Mawlid Nabi. How extreme is that? Where is your love for Allah and His Messenger? Uh, also, I mean, for, for using that as an argument, just a, just a side point for that, if that is the case, and if we uh, side with Bayhaq in saying that uh, the levels can go up and down, then only Allah knows this. We can't say that this will happen to this particular person because the akam for the day is not for us. Just like we can't say that this person is going to be in Jannah if he passes away. We only know this through Wahid. So if it is possible, it's possible in principle, but we don't know its application. So, In summary, those who permit 
seek to permit the Mawlid to have anomalies in their opinion and their arguments compared to the vast majority of the vast majority who prohibit it. The majority have prohibited it, have prohibited it whilst those who seek to permit it have only made the exception due to celebrations which only entail dhikr and a sharing of communal food between Muslims. However, as we have stated above, all paths to mischief must be blocked as a principle agreed to, agreed to be all scholars. None of the scholars have differed on this point. Okay, so now the Sheikh is talking about those people who are going to say that we are doing this out of not worship, but just because it's you know, convenient or we want to remember the Prophet uh, it's not a festival, uh, you know, what is wrong with doing you know, something like this, let's take a day out and learn about his life, all of these arguments now here. We're not saying that we're practicing or celebrating, we're just using this day to reflect or this day to get together. This is what the Sheikh is going to talk about here. Now, the first thing that he said here is that the, the, the argument of looking at the greater harm still applies. But like we said before, you can have that point, that's fair enough, but it's not, uh, it's still a bidder. You can argue that I'm not doing it out of worship, you can argue whatever you want, but as long as it's reoccurring and it's connected to an aspect of the religion, then it's a festival, Part of the Sharia. لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْسَكَمْ وَمِنْ هَاجَةٍ شَرَعَةٌ وَمِنْ هَاجَةٍ so. Even if we were to argue that Mawlid is merely eating and dhikr, then we know that we know, we know that, that now the celebration of the Mawlid are not reduced to just eating and, and dhikr. The Mawlid today entails many acts which are prohibited, which would lead to an agreement in its prohibition between the scholars. This is an answer question and I think what has been said is sufficient. However, it is important to expose some of the practices that happen during such events. I've been informed that some lay people take the molid as an occasion where they supplicate or seek blessings from the deceased or even stones in some cases. Okay, so now the Sheikh is giving a summary uh, of the whole argument. Those people who want to do it to worship Allah, he said it's a bid'ah. And those people who don't want to do it to worship, want to do it but not to worship Allah, is still a bid'ah and it's still not allowed. But uh, the scholars typically have now uh, three opinions. The scholars from the books that I've mentioned above have three opinions. One of the group of scholars have said that it is permissible to have such a festival as long as it doesn't lead to anything which is haram, such as grave worship, mixing, etc. And this is the opinion of a Suyuti. And the reason for this is he said that the asal is ibaha. We agree that there is no dalil. And we agree with you that if there is a greater harm then it's haram. That's why I'm saying that it's permissible for us to practice the Mawlid Nabi as long as the greater harm is not there. This is what Suyuti said and those others with him. The first opinion is that it's permissible. The second opinion is that it's makru but not haram. Makru, because you're doing something which is new, but again, there is no dalil to say it's haram. For you to say something is haram, you need dalil. And the third opinion, which is obviously the opinion of the majority, and this is the correct opinion based on what, was, what we've had here, is that it's haram, and it is an innovation to the religion. And even if it starts off as something small, it will lead to something big. And... Sheikh Usaimi has a long uh, footnote here, but we can conclude with eight different aspects as to why the Mawlid al Nabawi is a bid'ah and it's not legislated in the religion. Firstly, and the most important thing, is that it is Eid. And this is what uh, Sheikh Al Islam al Taymiyyah talks about in Iqtada Surat al Mustaqim that any festival or any kind of imitation of a festival, as long as it repeats itself annually, or even within a fixed period of time, like uh, Nukayim talked about when going to the Prophet's grave, it's a festival. And, you, and it's part of the Sharia, whether you like it or not. It's part of the religion, whether you like it or not. Number two, there is no dalil for it. Therefore, it's a bid'ah. If you want to do this, provide the evidence. If you have no evidence, it's an innovation. Number three, they differed on its date. Number three, they differed on its date. Like we said, Imam Malik, 
didn't hold it to be the 12th, even though some Malikis are doing it. Number four, from the aspect of Usul, the Hanafi Madhab would not recognize this action in its Usul. The whole principle of the Madhab is completely out the window if you want to do this. Number five, it leads to greater harm. It leads to shirk, it leads to bulu, it leads to exaggeration of the Prophet ﷺ, it leads to exaggeration of the pious people, and it leads to uh, music and free mixing. There's a contradiction in their own argument, number five. There's a contradiction in their own argument. So this is the fifth way we know that the opinion of it being permissible is not correct. Because you now you are saying that it's not a religious uh, festival, but you're, you're trying to use religious delil. Number six, uh, it's imitation of the kuffar. And this is quite clear in its asal. The person, whoever it is from the first minister or the other one, clearly introduced it to imitate the kuffar. There's another argument that even uh, Taymiyyah mentions in Iqtida Surat al-Mustaqim. Iqtida Surat al-Mustaqim is a book talking about imitation of the kuffar and its different forms. And he talks about festivals as a chapter. And in this as a chapter he says, do you think you're better than the Salaf? If you want to put something new into the religion, do you think you're better than Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali? Abu Hanifa himself, Ibn Mas'ud himself, you're following this path and you're saying that we are Hanafi, we take respect in the Hanafi Madhab, but you are following, you're completely contradicting the Usul and the Qawad as put down by Imam al azam that you call him. And then number eight, that the, um, that the religion now, this is a eighth point that I'm putting down here, which I think is very, very relevant, not just to the Mawlid, but other aspects of the religion in general, is when you culturalize the religion. So now people will be doing Milad and Nabi just because of the country they come from, or the language they speak, or the community that they live in. So now what you're doing is you're innovating something new into the religion, which is a major sin. Some of it is going to involve kufr, some of it is going to involve shirk. But even if it's a major sin, it's not to be taken lightly. Allah threatens us a fear of punishment for major, major sin. كُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ دِلَالٍ وَكُلُّ دِلَالٍ فِي النَّهُ and you're going to do that just because of your culture. So. There is no doubt that all of this is disbelief, even worse of those who worship idols. Idol worshippers, especially at the time of the Prophet, maintain that they are worshipping Allah and only worship these idols in order to gain, to gain closer to Allah in times of difficulty. However, grave worshippers worship, supplicate and seek the inhabitants of the graves during all measures. Uh, all measures in times of difficulty and ease. So what kufr can equate to this? What act of criminality is greater? How can they leave al qadir the able, Allah, and take their affairs to anything else and then claim to be a believer? Your Muslim brothers have practices the have fallen into, clear acts of kufr, and to Allah we belong and to him we will return. So here, if you look at this paragraph, it's basically Qawait al-Arba of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab in one paragraph. Shaykh al-Islam has a, has a book called Qawaii al the four principles when it comes to Tawheed and Naqeelah. The first one is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fought people even though that they said La ilaha illallah. al rububiyyah Tawheed al was not enough. Allah sent him and told him to fight people and take their wealth and drive them out of the cities if you have to just because they are not worshipping Allah. To remove oppression from society. Not that we go killing some people, that's not the objective. The objective is that we help them to rectify their way and rectify society. If they don't want to do that, it's fine, give us the jizya. If you don't want to do that, then you can go live somewhere else. But the point here is that we all, as society, have a good, wholesome society and we will go to Jannah together. The first point here, those people who say Tawheed is uh, Rububiyyah, is completely negated. How can people say La ilaha illallah but they're worshipping others than Allah in these festivals? The second principle that Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab mentioned is that those people say that they only worship the idols as wasila to Allah. They say, no, 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 we're not worshipping this stone. We're not worshipping this mobile phone that I'm devoted to. I'm worshipping Allah, but I'm using this as a vice to it. I'm using my phone to get closer to Allah. I mean, some people are doing this. But this is what uh, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab as mentioned, as the second principle. The third principle is that their objects of worship varied. Some of them worship angels, some of them worship trees, some of them worship stones. 
And then the fourth one, uh, like he's saying here, however, grave worshippers would supplicate, etc. So this is evidence or some kind of correlation to the third principle mentioned by Muhammad al Muhab. And then the last one, the Sheikh said, Muslims today, and this is very, very important, Muslims today are worse off than the kuffar of the Quraysh and Jahiliyyah before Tawheed came to them. How so? Those people who did shirk with Allah in Jahiliyyah, they used to do shirk with Allah predominantly only at the time of istighatha, when they needed some kind of help. When everything was fine and everything, their life was going good, they didn't go to these idols. They didn't go to these idols. When everything is good, you have money, you have wealth, everything is fine, you don't go to the idols, you worship Allah alone. If something afflicts you, then you go to the idol and say, Oh, Uzza, or Oh, Lat, help me with this difficulty that I'm facing. The point here is that this is what they only used to go to these places in the time of difficulty. <coughs> Imam Shultani here is saying, How can they leave Al Qadim and take their affairs to anything else and claim to be a believer? How can they take their istighatha and their difficulties to other than Allah when only Allah can, can aid you? But the reason why they are the Muslim woman today is worse than the kuffar of the Quraysh is because we ask Allah in times of ease and difficulty to other than Allah. So you will find people going to uh, these idols and they wear a taweez or they wear some kind of string or they wear this, to get barakah. This is not known at the time of the Quraysh. This is not, even the Prophet ﷺ when he came to them, they didn't do things like that. They would ask Allah alone when everything was fine. When they needed help, then that's when they would do their shirk. But now us, in times of ease and difficulty, are falling into shirk. May Allah have mercy on Mahdi, Adin Abbas, Bin al Mansur, who put a stop to such practices as much as he, as, as he was able. And the bridge fatwa of Abu Ali Muhammad ibn Ali Shukani, Allah have mercy upon him. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his, mess, on his messenger, his family and companions. Allahumma arin la haqqa hanfu wa zukna tiba'a wa arin ambaat kabaat wa zukna jtinaaba. Allahumma jalla min al hudat wa muqtadeen. I Allah give us the ability to see what is right and follow it and stay away from what is evil and stay away from it. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being patient uh, and I'll ask to thank Hassan for his supper with my poor level of English.